All right. So everything looks good if I move forward. It looks good. So the brief introduction here, Angelique Tinney, the president of Briefs, also my friend. I've gotten to know Angelique pretty well over the last couple of years, is going to chat about real estate. I'm going to interject some loan stuff and let's get going on, Angelique. Thank you so much. Yeah, you do. All right. So why I love real estate investing, I believe it's one of the most powerful financial vehicles. And it's amazing in so many ways. It can lower your taxes. It creates equity and cash flow. It forces you to save money. It gives you leverage through loans and different financial means that we'll talk about in a bit that uh, Marsha and uh, John are so good at. It hedges against inflation. It's usually stable, but kind of weird sometimes. Can You can lose stable money. Stable in the long run, guys. you got to get the long run perspective. Here. Yeah. So the cool thing about that is individually, we all know this, but when you collectively add that together and put all these benefits together, you know, I have that we have tax depreciation, mortgage pay down, principal reduction, appreciation, cash flow. When you add all that together, you can get pretty good returns. So each one may be one or 2% or appreciation may be 5%. But when you add that all together, including your leverage, maybe you're getting 10% or more a year in reality. I don't know that as a fact. That's my theory <laughs> about how it all works. Mm -hmm. But um, does that make sense? <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So um, everyone's journey is going to be different. No one has the same amount of time or resources or connections, knowledge. Your personalities are all different, what you're going to like and your strengths and weaknesses, the area you live in, whether it's cheap or expensive. Your cash flow, you know, if you're wanting cash flow or if you're wanting appreciation, and everybody enters the market at a different time and economic cycle with different interest rates, um, your local economy is going to make a difference for you as far as employment, <clears throat> moving in and out of the area, and your population increasing. So all that is going to make everyone's past so different. So no two people are going to have the same real estate investing journey by far. So this is the educational talk. I am going to be talking about taxes. Um, we're going to talk about finance. Uh, there's going to be legal stuff kind of mixed in, but we're just education people. We're not any of these as far as tax advisors or legal advisors or financial advisors. So, so consult them if you want more details on anything I'm talking about. So I wanted to give a broad overview of many types of different real estate and all of these things we're talking about in every single little line I'm going to be talking about could be a seminar of their own. So we're not going to be able to get in depth on anything, but I just wanted to open everybody's minds to the possibilities out there. And I have never seen a presentation that had everything in one spot. So this is going to be just a smorgasbord of what the possibilities are and what you can do. So obviously, you know, you've got houses and condos, the mobile homes can be on land or in a park. You could do the unusual things like boat slips. Uh, you got land and agricultural land, small multifamily farms and waterfront. Um, in the commercial category, you've got mobile home parks, apartment buildings, self-storage, unusual things like car lots or car washes, um, warehouses, office buildings, retail buildings, industrial mixed use, REITs. So investing in REITs um, instead of a whole building. So you can still be in the real estate arena without having to commit so much into it. Um, REITs do fluctuate with interest rates. And I've had some REITs that I've been whacked pretty hard on my investments when the rates went up. So um, I didn't study that well before <laughs> I invested in my REITs. Um, so that's something to be aware of. DSTs are kind of like REITs, but they are a different category. It's called Delaware Statutory Trust. That's what a lot of people do because you're able to 1031 exchange into those. So a lot of people that are at the end of their real estate journey will often go into DSTs as a way to continue investing, but not have to manage properties. And they are trusts that are kind of like REITs, but a different ownership um, format and and similar to syndications as well. Syndications are um, group collective funds going into buying often apartment buildings, but could be any kind of commercial or, or um, short-term housing or anything could be the topic of the syndication. Um, so one thing I really like is called Ground Floor, and that is a crowdfunding website where you can um, invest a little fraction or more 
and hard money loans. And so people that are out there flipping or trying to get a rental ready for uh, their clients will try to get financing on ground floor. And so they're paying hard money rates and you're, you can join in and be part of their funding. So I've personally done this. And the reason I wanna bring it up and specifically talk about ground floor is because you can invest as little as $10 on ground floor. So in my case, I invested in 400 different loans and I did that between $10 and $50. And um, I did that before the interest rates rose and as the supply chain issues were still happening. So out of my 400 loans, there were 100 that did not pay back quickly and did not pay back in time. So 300 did well and I got like a 9% return and 100 have not done so well and they've been very slow to pay and get their home sold or finished. Um, so those are trickling in a little bit of time and it's been quite a long time now. So I still getting return on some of those that come in and on some of those I am actually losing some principal I put in. So at this moment, I still have a 9% return on ground floor, but um, I still have probably 60 loans outstanding that have not paid off yet. So there's still loans I could be losing money on. But I love ground floor as a platform and I want to bring it up because as the economy turns, so who knows what's going to happen in our economy the next year or two. But as our economy gets good again and stable and things get normalized and appreciation is normal and everything like that, I think ground floor is a really good place to invest when the economy is an upward cycle. All right. And then one other kind of investing would be note investing. If you don't want to deal with the tenants and toilets, um, note investing is a way you can still be kind of in real estate, but on the mortgage side and make money in real estate. You don't get the appreciation, but you get the cash flow. All right. So different kinds of strategies within the real estate arena. So obviously everybody knows the typical buy and hold rental property. Um, some people like cash flow and they'll invest in Texas or Florida or somewhere in the South. Other people like appreciation and will do uh, Seattle and different more expensive areas. Uh, California is a good appreciating market. So, um, you know, you have to decide whether you, which one you want, which one fits in your lifestyle better. And, you know, if you want a little of both, maybe that's the secret combo you'd like. Uh, so Airbnbs, you can do just a room in your house or you could do a whole house or a tiny home or anything, including a tent uh, on Airbnbs. So, we all know about it now, and it's a great way to go. Um, furnished rentals or, you know, the traveling nurse kind of category that's not as strong right now, but it was very strong. Um, so nomading professionals, so they need furnished rentals for a little longer term than the Airbnb. Some use Airbnb, some use Furnish Finder to find where they're going or Craigslist. Um, of course, you've got flipping homes like we all see on HGTV. You've got value add. Um, that's often what we describe in an apartment building where you go in and um, maybe put the utilities onto the tenants so that you're, the landlord is not having absorbed that cost. That's a typical value add play in an apartment building. So, of course, we've got remodeling in any, every kind of category for apartments or single family homes or anything else. Um, you can change use. You could take something from what's you know, being talked about a lot right now is from an office building to residential. And there is a lot of challenges in that, but if you can find the right building that works for that, that could be a really big play you could make. Um, new construction, you know, some people used to just buy an option on a property, you know, get a contract in as something was being built and just write appreciation as the market was going up. So, you know, just over the year that the home's being built, they may gain appreciation right there. And then obviously, if you buy new construction, you don't have to put so much effort into everything about it. So <clears throat> there's wholesaling, very, very popular beginner strategy. There's a lot on the internet about wholesaling. So just Google that and you'll probably find tons of YouTubes on that. Rental arbitrage tends to be in the Airbnb category. And it's something I've personally done a couple of times where you rent a property and then you re-rent it out on Airbnb. So you need to disclose with the owner of the property and get their permission that you're going to be re-renting it and make sure they're okay with that. 
So lease options, so buying a property on lease option or selling a property on lease option are both cool and interesting ways to go that can save you on real estate commissions and has all kinds of advantages. Uh, master leasing, that tends to be like on an apartment building where instead of taking one unit, you're taking the whole apartment complex and you're leasing the whole thing and then you're taking responsibility of the management and leasing it out one by one. Um, seller financing, you could buy seller financing, you can sell on seller financing. When you sell on seller financing, you get that interest. Um, foreclosure, you know, we may be seeing more of those. We'll see here shortly. Um, Washington State does have a lot of foreclosure laws. Um, so make sure you are well aware of the foreclosure laws or the, or if you're getting, so if you're buying at the auction, let's say, you don't need to worry about the foreclosure laws because the foreclosure is already processed and done if you're buying at the auction. But if you are talking to somebody that they're still in the process of foreclosure, be very aware of the laws in Washington state if that's going to be your business strategy. Because there's special laws you need to be very aware of um, that have big penalties. So um, you can do things like rooming houses. Uh, Wendy, who's on the call, does rooming houses in big homes around the popular Seattle neighborhoods. And uh, she loves it. And you know, student housing is kind of similar to that or some or having a building that's similar for drug rehab or VA or um, people getting out of prison are some of the specialties that some of our REAPS members have specialized in. Um, senior housing, like adult family homes. In Washington State, you're allowed six residents in a home. Um, so that can be good if you're liking that kind of category. Um, house hacking and roommates, so similar kind of to the rooming house. And you can find great houses that design well with you know the basement completely separate or um, an area that's in the house that's almost separate if you don't like roommates so um, that's a good way to go and there's now financing options that do allow rental income of those roommates um, towards your qualifying with certain conditions so john can fill us in on that and that's something i didn't make a note of so that's a good one to talk about um, so that's kind of like what I was just describing, a mother-in-law apartment or an accessory dwelling unit. Um, I have always owned properties with these in them. As a single gal, it made a huge difference in my life when I had a property with those in them to help me um, do my real estate investing. So um, now dadus and backyard cottages are super popular in Seattle and um, elsewhere, of course, but very trendy in Seattle. So if you have a way to finance building something in your backyard and your backyard supports it, that's the way to go. There's a few different strategies on financing, um, HELOCs, and there's some lenders now that are starting to specialize in that. So uh, we would need to do some research to find the right direction for that. Um, and then once you do have that dadu in the backyard, a lot of people are condominiumizing them and selling them off uh, separately. So they can even sell that basement apartment separately. So it could be a three unit they you condominiumize. Um, there's timeshares, of course. I do not feel like my timeshare has been an investment for me <laughs> personally, but uh, maybe some of them out there are. And um, so other strategies that might include other people's loans that you take over an assumption of somebody's loan. They have an existence right now, which could be really good with these super low interest rates we just passed. Um, subject two is something where you're taking over their loan, but you're not qualifying to do that. On the assumption you're doing the qualification process, and the subject two, you're doing it without qualifying. And it's not a process the bank likes so much, and some um, escrow and title will not work on those kind of properties, but some will. All right. So a wrap is a portion of the subject two and also the seller financing component of it for the seller's equity of the home. And John may have better descriptions in a, a brief way of these properties. I have them on the financing section as well. And then um, overall timing of your real estate investing, um, what the economy is doing. So you want to definitely ride the wealth waves. So right now we're kind of in a choppy wave uh, situation with uh, the high interest rates and not a lot of homes coming on the market with people protecting those interest rates they do have that are great on the homes they have right now. So timing is super important and um, can make a big difference. So there's a lot of people that say, you know, 
you buy real estate, anytime you buy real estate is a good thing. But if you have the timing, it's even a better thing. So um, <laughs> <laughs> um, seasonality. So I talk about this a lot at the REAPS meetings uh, when I do the market report, because every year there's a slow time of year during the holidays that prices tend to go down on the homes that do sell. So it's a great time to buy if you're an investor from this time. I always feel like it's the time right when um, we have to turn the clocks back or forward, whatever it is in October. Uh, this year it was in November. So when it gets dark at four o'clock, <laughs> that's when I feel like it starts being the time to go out and make deals in real estate up until January and February. So January and February are stronger months than November and December. But the still, deals can still be had made through that time period. And then the seasonality is stronger. And a lot of people are buying and selling in the spring and summer, especially the spring. That's when the prices actually do tend to go up the most. Um, so I say have the wind at your back and sell in the spring and buy in the winter. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, staging obviously can make a huge difference in impressions. That's just one more thing and component of what you do in your real estate. So, hopefully, I can get the slide to go the right way now. All right, financing. We're gonna. I'm gonna take a break and let John talk now because this is his. <laughs> All right. So you can see the ulterior motive Angelique has here, which is to introduce you to the broad spectrum of real estate that's available. And each one of those topics could be a seminar in itself. And if you go to the different REAPS meetings, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get each one of those topics as a seminar in itself. And I think I've seen almost every one of them there. So because it's hard to, to take all that in. There's so much broad spectrum that you can do in real estate, creativity in different areas and all of that that you want to kind of figure out what you want to invest in and then lean that direction and go to specific meetings and get the education and get the knowledge that you can be successful there. No one's going to tackle all of that. It's just too much. Um, loans are the same way. So I'm not going to read off all of those loans, but there are a variety of ways to finance properties. You can get loans through institutional banks. You can get loans through private individuals. You can get loans by doing the seller carryback um, mm -hmm. that Angelique mentioned in her presentation. There's all of that available. What you want to do is you want to line yourself up with my um, suggestion here is when you look at the, all of these financing options available, you line yourself up with a loan officer, a mortgage advisor that knows these well, that you have trust with, that, that can work with you on them, and then kind of glue yourself to them, glue yourself to a good real estate agent, glue yourself to a good organization where you get education, and that's really good for you. I do want to mention a couple things. There is such a wide variety of mortgages available that you really need to talk to a mortgage professional probably in depth about your specific situation and strategize and see what works best for you. There are changes that happen in the mortgage industry um, frequently. For instance, one of the most significant ones just recently, Fannie Mae changed its guidelines where you can now use a 5% down and purchase a one through a fourplex property. So you can buy a two duplex, triplex, or fourplex with 5% down as an owner occupied purchase. That's very different than a week ago. That just went into effect this month. And it used to be a, a duplex, triplex was 15% down, a fourplex, I believe, was 25% down. It effectively removed those properties from first time home buyers' consideration when they didn't have that down payment. Now, if you want to get into real estate and you want it to help it cash flow for you and pay the mortgage with a 5% down, you can buy with conventional financing and four unit. Then you get the advantage, the value of three units there. They're going to pay you rent and potentially knock off most of your mortgage payment. Now, of course, you're a landlord and it comes with the landlord responsibilities and all of that. You're going to learn a lot about that at REAPS as well. There are specialized loans. The DSCR loan is something that a lot of investors love debt service coverage ratio. If you don't have income, you can purchase a property and use just the income on the property as the qualifying income for the purchase. It's obviously an investor loan because you have to have income on the property. It's not owner occupied. It is non owner occupied, but you don't have to show any kind of income. There's no, no W-2s. There's no tax returns. There's no nothing. As I showed at one of the presentations, that I was at, when you look at the loan application on that page, it's basically blank because we don't get your other income. We use this the subject property income. There uh, is a special loan called the all-in-one loan, which we've mentioned 
um, at different times in the Reeves presentation. It is for high end borrowers and specifically borrowers who have really good cash flow relative to their expenses. So if you roll a lot of money through to your bank account relative to your expenses, it doesn't mean you have to have a lot of money. The point is relative to the outgo, then the all in one loan can cut years and potentially tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars of interest off your loan. The effective, uh, recently on my, one of my clients, the effective interest rate was less than 1% and they were gonna pay that loan off in less than three years without any change in their budget. So the point is, there are lots of lending strategies and there are lots of loans for different people in different situations. And we should sit down and talk about your specific situation and see which one meets your needs there. Um, any questions so far guys on Angelique stuff and on the financing, you can put those in the chat box. Well, really I think a lot of people don't realize that rental income, like on a threeplex, can actually count towards your income. Absolutely right. It can count toward your qualifying income, is what Angelique's saying. So that means that if you don't qualify for that property by itself, because it's a million dollars, and I have this exact situation right now with a client. They qualify for about a 400 and some thousand dollar single family residence. They can't find the single family residence that really meets their needs there. They found a fourplex, which is a little over a million dollars. Now they can do, you can, you can do FHA financing too, guys. You can either do FHA with three and a half percent down, or you can do conventional with 5% down. Use those other three units as qualifying income, and they qualify for more property because of that. And it looks like they're going to be able to buy this particular property. Good point, Angela. Yes, that saved me when I got divorced because I qualified for 500,000 at the time. You can't buy anything in Seattle or at least side for 500,000. So I was able to get a duplex for 750 and I could qualify for that and um, be able to still live in West Seattle here. And, you know, it takes some time to find a place that's cool. This was all remodeled we did, but um, it takes time to find the space that you like, you know, to make that nice kitchen and that kind of thing. And I even end up with a view, which is pretty amazing. Um, mm -hmm. But you, um, you know, every multifamily does not have that. You usually have the galley kitchens and that kind of stuff. So you got to find one with the right space to have the lifestyle included. See, and there's one of the huge advantages you have of coming to the REAPS organization. You get people like Angelique, who has been through a tough situation, a divorce in her situation. She wanted to purchase a home and she figured out a way to do it. It's gonna require some flexibility. It's gonna require some strategy. It's gonna require some give on your part, but you can totally, you can potentially purchase real estate. We have people like Wendy Ceccarelli who's given a presentation, as Angelique mentioned just earlier, she's the queen of house hacking, it's called. Renting out rooms in a house to pay for the mortgage, or even you could rent a house and rent out rooms and you need to sub-rent and let your tenant, your landlord know, of course, and con conceivably pay all of the payment for you. Wendy's a, a, a pro at that. My point is you're going to meet different people who have been through different situations and have different resources. And when you start hanging out with them and going out for lunch and chatting with them at the end of a presentation, you're going to learn as well from the people that are there as you did from the presentation itself. And it might put you in a different direction in your real estate career. Yeah, so John does some unique loans. He has bank statement loans as well as those DSCR loans. He has, does what he calls soft money. It, I think it's a term he kind of coined where... Um, he has loans where a CPA can make a statement for you or your bank, sure. I say bank statements, but your tax returns or whatever. So he has all different kinds of loans. And then um, you want to talk about seller carry back, what kind of loans mix with those? Sure, we can chat about that. Let me just leverage off what you just said. The One of our first presentations in the new year for our, our, this webinar is going to be seven ways that you can purchase a home as a self-employed borrower with seven different kinds of lending strategies. That's the soft money that Angelique is talking about. And one way, of course, is you can use bank statements for income, and that's a very preferable way for a lot of people. But you can do the CPA letter, and we're going to talk about a few others on that presentation. Seller financing is a, a great way to go. I mean, there's no bank involved if you're doing seller financing. Oftentimes, however, um, you may need some other financing to come in along with the seller financing to make it work. And you want to be careful of the terms, both of the seller financing, and if you have to put a second mortgage in there, the terms on that. Um, that lends itself to you can assume loans as well, especially loans that have lower interest rate. FHA loans have an assumability, and some of those loans have a 2.75% rate. And 
the problem that but, but you, you have to do an assumption, you're going to go through the current lender that has the loan and they're going to qualify you for that loan. But if you qualify for it, you may be able to take over that mortgage without doing it subject to the problem or the challenge of subject to is that that technically violates the due on sale clause in the loan. So Angelica was talking about you go in and you take over someone's payments, but you don't actually get qualified with that lender to make the payment on the loan. And typically, I know many investors that do this and it works out just fine. But you need to be aware that that lender can call that loan due because it can violate the due on sale clause. And what happens there is there's a change in the vesting of title, and that's what triggers the due on sale clause. So if they call it, you need to be prepared with a backup plan so you can take care of that. And you should certainly just want to be aware of it. So Anthony talked about risk for the seller. There's also risk for you, the buyer, and you want to be aware of that. Um, however, one way to do it is to qualify for the mortgage and get pre-approved there and take over the mortgage. The challenge there may be is that property is grown in value, as Angelique talked about, as properties do, and you may need more money than you have for the down payment. Well, it so happens we have a second mortgage, which will allow for you to qualify for and take over a first mortgage, and we'll put the second mortgage in place for part of the down payment, and you'll bring in the other portion of the down payment. So that's a relatively new development. There, most second mortgage lenders will not allow that, but that's pretty new. And that's why you want to be with someone that kind of stays on top of this so that when you see opportunities like that, you know that there's a way to put it together. That's awesome. I hadn't heard that. You want to talk about burrs? Burrs, as coined by Brandon, I think, of uh, Bigger Pockets, right? Which right. stands for buy, rehab, um, refinance, rent. Re uh, reinvent what's the one R missing there? Buy, rehab, rent, rent, refinance, repeat. Thank you, Angelique. Um, <laughs> so typically you're buying a home that needs a lot of work. You're not going to get a regular kind of financing, although they do exist. I mean, that's the point here. There's a strategy for everybody. You could buy that home and you could get an FHA rehab loan and do a significant rehab to the property with an FHA loan with 3.5% down. You could buy that home with a conventional loan and do a rehab and do the same thing. Believe it or not, VA and I think USDA even now offer rehab loans with really low down payment options. Those are mostly um, almost all owner occupied loans. So if that works for you, it's great. But oftentimes it doesn't work for you. So you buy it with hard money is what it's called or private money. You need a chunk of change. We don't worry too much about your income. Don't worry too much about your credit. Those are equity driven loans. We will fund typically up to 80% of the purchase price and up to 65, maybe 70% of the end value. So we look at both those numbers. You're going to buy it for 400,000. You can put a lot of work into it. It's going to worth 600,000 when you're done. We're going to lend up to 80% of the 400 and up to 65, maybe 70% of the 600 when you're done. You're going to bring in, actually, I think I have one to do 90%. You're going to bring in a minimum of 10% down. That's our financing around that and oftentimes more. So you use the hard money loan. It gives you the rehab funds. We're throwing that into the loan for you along with the purchase. You do draws. You fix up the property. You get done with it. You rent it. You refinance it into, into a regular loan. It could be a DSCR loan. could be a bank statement. could be just a conforming loan. And you pull your money back out when you do the refinance. And the repeat means you do it all over again with another property. So it's, it's a business model that somebody just, some of our investors just focus on. Well said. So um, cross collateralization is something on the list that people may not be aware of. And that is when you use a lot of properties as the collateral for getting a loan. So if you have a lot of rental properties and you have equity in them, and maybe it's not a ton of equity, but collectively it's a lot of equ equity. Um, there are some lenders that will use multiple properties for the collateral. And we have a sponsor named Flynn Family Lending that will do that. So in the crowdfunding category, you can kind of do a hard money crowdfunding to get your properties financed as well. Um, for the multifamily area, there's syndication where you get a lot of people um, to contribute funds and there's a lot of rules with that. You need lawyers involved. So you'll definitely be studying that if you do that. Yeah. And then paying down. Go ahead. Um, I said, yes, I'm agreeing with you. And, you know, the equity loans at the very top there, you know, Angelique's talked about that. But I just want to mention for you, some of our clients' business strategies to purchase owner-occupied, live there for a couple, three years, get the property where, where it's ready to need to be, get some equity, 
keep it, rent it, go buy another property. That's a great business strategy, and it depends on how quickly you need to move to buy properties. But one of the things that I'm going to suggest that you try to do when you're there is while that property is owner-occupied, while you're living there, that is the time, as long as you have enough equity, that you want to put the line of credit on that property. Because lines of credit are great tools. Once they're set up on a property, they're there and you can pay them down. And it'll be great when you move into the next property to have a one or two properties behind you that you have lines of credit on, which you can pull and use for down payments on other properties. Or maybe you're gonna buy that fixer and do the Burr method there, and you're gonna use your HELOC as the cash to get down into for the down payment for the property. So if you can get one or two lines of credit set up and manage them well, you don't use them to buy the boat, not the Harley. I mean, that's up to you, but my suggestion is if you wanna build wealth with real estate, that you're going to focus on real estate for the time being. The one place where you can borrow money that we will allow to use for the down payment on a house is a HELOC because it's a secured loan on a property. We're going to put that extra payment, the HELOC payment in your debt ratio. And as long as you qualify, that could be your down payment for your next home. Very cool. And it made me think too, while you were talking about getting that money for the rehabs, you can also get personal lines of credit that aren't tied to a property. So there's a few lenders around our area, um, Washington State Employee Credit Union. I've heard they'll do 30K without much qualifying. So um, I've got, you know, Verity Credit Union, BCU um, as different places. They're, they're usually credit unions that will do these personal lines of credit. So um, that could definitely get you a kitchen and bath remodel on an affordable home. So. <laughs> there you go. Zach right. is asking in the chat what a piggyback loan is. And so you, if you look down in the list there, it says piggyback loans, 80, 10, 10. The piggyback loan is the 10. Um, the 80 stands for an 80% first mortgage when you're buying a property. And the thing about mortgages typically is if you go over 80% of the value of the home when you buy the property with your first mortgage, you're going to get mortgage insurance. FHA has mortgage insurance premium. Conventional has private mortgage insurance. It's effectively the same thing. It's an insurance policy that you as the buyer get the pleasure of paying for the lender because you're putting less than 20% down. One way to avoid that and get an 80% loan and only put 10% down is to put a second mortgage in there. That's the 80-10 portion of it is a second mortgage for 10% of the purchase price of the home. And then you bring in a 10% down. Because the first mortgage is 80%, there is no mortgage insurance involved. The second mortgage could be a HELOC we're talking about, or it could be a fixed rate second. And if it is a HELOC, it's built in for you. You pay down the HELOC as fast as you can and it opens it up so you can use it for other purposes. And then a year or two down the road, you buy another property, the HELOC is opened up. You can access the HELOC there and use that for the down payment on the new property. All right, so I know this were really popular before the 08 crash. Are they still out there and in existence now? Which what, the 801010? loans, yeah. Yes, they are. We can do piggyback loans with either a fixed rate. And actually, I believe, I, I hope I'm not over speaking here. I do have a non-owner occupied fixed rate second mortgage. Um, you're going to pay for that. OK, the rate is pretty steep on the non-owner, but it's and it's a fixed rate. It's not a HELOC, but you can use that in conjunction with the first mortgage to purchase a property. So if you have questions on it, give me a call. I need to check on the parameters of that to know for sure just exactly what you can do. All right. There's also great ways to pay down your mortgage. So a lot of people know about biweekly payments or paying an extra payment a, a year, but there's also ways you can use a HELOC to help you progress your pay down of your mortgage quickly. And that, <laughs> That's right. That, that takes a lot of effort for your brain to <laughs> wrap around. So um, you got to watch a lot of videos on that. We actually have some people that specialize in that as a company called United Financial. Um, one of our members is a representative for them. So um, there's ways to make your mortgage pay down very quickly that you can get involved in, especially if you have a lot of cash flow running through your life. Like you have a lot of rental properties and you've got money streaming through that also goes back out, but it can help you in the process. So. Yeah, so the um, point is our goal, our mission statement with, with that we have, guys, is to help you build wealth with real estate if you come to our company for mortgages here. That's why I talk a lot about strategy because when does strategy beat rate? Almost always when it helps you build wealth, more wealth with real estate because you have a different way of doing it. So we're going to talk about strategy and we're talking about your resources and we're going to talk about work, what works for you. And usually part of that equation is paying down the debt once you have it as quickly as you can. 
And that program that Angelique just mentioned, it takes away the brain power and actually you plug your numbers in, it'll tell you exactly where to make payments every single month between your credit cards and your HELOC and your first mortgage to pay off things faster. It's kind of like you have to, that they do the snowball method there where you pay off one credit card oh, and then take the money. About Dave Ramsey? That's right, Dave Ramsey's method. And you snowball it. Well, this is a little more um, intricate than that and it can be even faster because you got a software program that'll help you do that. So are you a representative of that software too? Um, my wife is with, um, Chris who has it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So partners, you know, everybody leans, leans on their relatives, right? Uh, joint ventures, financing <laughs> partners, way to go. <laughs> <laughs> and other people's loans. We talked about briefly on the assumption, the subject to the wraps, the lease options and the, the master leases. So. Um, there we go on most of those I have on the screen right now. So I'll move forward. Tax benefits. Um, so I am by far not a tax accountant, but I'm going to just talk about these things that I may be talking right or wrong. Just know that. <laughs> so, okay. All right. So if you keep a, a house and sell it within a year, so that's if you sell it before a year's out, that's short-term gains, and that's ordinary income. So a lot of flippers are in that category where they'll try to flip a house within six months, and that becomes ordinary income unless they do some things with entities on that. Um, Long-term gains, so anything you keep for more than a year, you get much more favorable tax um, percentage rates on that. Depreciation is something that government created to give real estate investors an advantage, and it lets you um, say that the house is, is uh, depreciating. Um, I don't know the right word to, other than depreciating. Um, and so it lets you take a tax write-off. It's kind of a phantom ghost write-off that doesn't really happen because when you sell the house, it'll probably be still worth what you paid for it or more. But in the meantime, you get this tax deduction on your taxes. And um, so that can make, give you um, and a big advantage for paying down tax, not paying, <laughs> oh gosh, not paying as much taxes for a while. And bonus depreciation is something that the has been in the past, but Trump made it even better, I believe. So you can write off even more quickly on your depreciation. And also if you're buying vehicles for your business or different things like that, you get bonus depreciation and can write things off right away instead of having to capitalize them as they were in the past. Cost segregation is an amazing way to get your taxes much lower, especially if you're a real estate agent as well. Um, the combination of being a real estate agent and cost segregation is very, very powerful. So um, Anderson Advisors probably has some good videos on that. Anderson Advisors does a lot of um, asset protection kind of videos and tax strategy. Um, so you'll find some good advice from them on those kinds of topics. And they'll actually tell you what depreciation is much better than I did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if you don't take depreciation when you sell the property, you still have to pay what is called depreciation recapture. So that's about 25%, I believe. It might be 20%. But um, so whether you take depreciation up front, which is an advantage, at the end, when you sell a rental property you've held, the government requires depreciation recapture. So you might as well take that depreciation up front and have the advantage um, because you will get a tax at the end. One way to avoid that tax is to do a 1031 exchange and you defer that tax later down the road. And another cool thing about 1031 exchanges is if you have the foresight and the vision to decide what your home dream home is going to be, you could actually make a plan towards that over time and 1031 exchange from your rentals into your dream home situation. It takes a couple steps of maneuvering and uh, um, planning to do, but we do have a video on the REAPS website about doing that. Um, and it's a really cool strategy when you have the foresight of knowing what you want in the end. Um, so everybody gets a personal exemption on the home that they own. For singles, it's up to 250000 married up to half a million. So as long as you lived in the home two out of five years, owner occupied, you get that advantage. So one strategy is just to keep moving every couple of years and um, get that appreciation <laughs> and, and right. um, what you, yeah, um, what you've done to that home in the meantime. So at any advantage. So we're almost done with taxes. Um, 
you, you do get to rent your own personal home for 14 days a year tax free. Who knows why, but you do. And so if there's a golf tournament that comes to town or like if you're in Kentucky, the Kentucky Derby, something that's huge and every room is rented out in your city, it's really good for that kind of scenario. Um, if you have a duplex like I do, you can, you know, write up half your, um, I haven't been doing it, but I should, um, half your landscaping or, you know, half the tools you buy for maintenance, that kind of thing. Half your utilities are part business expense. So that's a really nice way to go if you're living in the property that you're also having as an investment. You can also 1031 exchange a portion of the property. So the part that's business use, you can 1031 exchange. And then you are in a business when you have real estate, so you can write off things like your computer and your cell phone. And there are rules on everything, of course. So um, you got to do it the right way. Um, buy where you want to go. So if you have relatives that you always have to go visit Louisiana, buy some real estate there. So your airfare could be a write off <laughs> and you still do have to do it the right way. You have to have a certain number of business days to personal days and the weekends count uh, as, uh, you get the weekends kind of as a bonus. Those aren't business days. So, um, so let's say. I'm not going to know the exact rules, but let's say you work on your rental property for three days of the week. You have personal days, two of the days of the week, and then the weekends don't count as um, business or personal days. So you could stay there for a week and work three days and um, not four days. So I may not have that right. That's a rule you need to check on. Um, but your travel can be a tax write off. So you could do a vacation area that might be even more exciting for your passions to do somewhere fun to go. Um, for where you have your real estate. And then when you go, when you do have a home that you've had a while and you have some appreciation in it, seller financing is a good exit strategy to help you lower your taxes and you get the interest on um, whatever you can negotiate on selling that too. We just had a REAPS member um, do an example where he sold a commercial property he had and um, he had he got 12% interest when he sold that property. So wow. he really gained when he, the seller financing. So that was really awesome. All right. So real estate well, has. Let me we piggyback on it. that, Angelique, before we leave. Okay. The, the, so as Angelique said at the beginning, we're not tax advisors. We're not giving tax advice. You do want to consult a tax advisor, but um, intrinsic in what we're saying here is, is building your, what we call power team. So a good real estate agent that knows investment is, is part of it. A good mortgage person who knows mortgages, a, a good title person, but also clearly someone who knows taxes really well can save you thousands of dollars um, in taxes. And it's not really how much money you make, is it? It's how much money you keep after all of the bills, including the tax bills are paid. And a tax advisor can help you a lot. They can structure things really, really well for you up front, which will save you thousands of dollars of taxes later on. And that's really important part of it. So strategy in your team is really, really important here. Um, one thing I get occasionally is a self-employed buyer that comes to me and says, I want to purchase property, but they also want to write off as much expenses like Angelique is talking about. So they reduce their taxable income and reduce their taxes. That's just a difficult balancing act, isn't it, for our self-employed borrowers? So if you want to purchase properties, I say pay the taxes, make money, write off what's reasonable. And what some of my clients do is they'll give me their taxes before they're filed so we can calculate what's called their qualifying income. For instance, one of the obvious things is depreciation, which Angelique mentioned, is a taxable, uh, is a non-taxable expense. It reduces your taxable income on the property so you pay less taxes. But because it's a, it's a, on what we call a paper loss. It's not really a loss, the depreciation. Your property is really going up in value. We will add that back into your qualifying income when you qualify for a home. So you want to know that kind of stuff. Capital expenditures, if done properly, can really reduce your taxes and can also be added back in if they're done properly. And that's the careful thing here. So you have more qualifying income to purchase homes. And if you're going to build wealth, it is easier to buy homes when you qualify for loans than when you don't. I mean, we have soft money when bank statements is a great one and DSCR loan is a great one, but the rates are higher and the costs are higher. So if you can buy it with Fannie Mae with conventional loans for the time being until you get the maximum, which is 10 loans with them, um, that's a great way to go. So watch your taxes, guys. Thanks, Angelique. Yeah, good tips. 
So I just wanted to point out, you know, we all can think of a few risks with real estate, but there might be more than you realize. And there's way more than I have here on this list. So I'm going to run through really quick <laughs> some of them. So something to think about is when you sell a property, if you're not a real estate agent, 10% um, off the top goes towards closing costs between the agent, the escrow, um, the selling fees that we have in the state, uh, excise tax. Um, all of it adds up to about 10% of your property, usually about 9% people around it to 10%. So just realize you never really own that last 10% of your property. If you're a real estate agent and can save part of that, then um, it's a little less, but and that there's good reason to be a real estate agent in our state with real estate being so expensive um, just to save that amount. But um, you have, of course, roof leaks and pests that you have to deal with. Um, you have fires and evictions and remodel cost overruns and market changes, squatters, market, if the market contracts like it may be happening now, it is just to what extent. Um, if an employer leaves town like we had Boeing did, you, know, you can feel those contractions when Boeing left or Boeing before we had all the tech when Boeing would say they were doing a layoff, you could feel it. And I was a real estate agent and I could feel it when it happened, the market just chills. Um, neighborhood demand could, you know, change because of um, a homeless camp moving into the neighborhood, for example. Um, you can have theft and graffiti. Um, rent control laws could come in effect. It looks like that's not going to happen for our area right now, but it is always a possibility that something like that could happen. Um, your population decreases affects your value. Your law changes, code changes. Um, you know, hazardous materials within your building, neighborhood disputes or neighbor disputes. I've had a couple of neighbor disputes that I would have never dreamed would have happened, um, but neighbors were claiming rights on my property or demanding that I pay for things that weren't mine to pay for, and I had to get lawyers involved. So, you know, lawyer, hiring lawyers is not something I like to do, but sometimes <laughs> you're forced into the situation. And then lawsuits and foreclosures are a couple other things. So just, you know, I'm sure there's 20 or 50 other things we could think of to put on this list, but I just want to make people well aware, have their eyes open. <laughs> yeah, real estate takes right. work, just like any other wealth building exercise. You're going to work for it, guys. Yes, it's never been easy on my journey. I heard Marsha's talk um, when she was the guest for John, and Marsha is John's sister, and she was always in the right place at the right time and just said yes, and life... I was really good to her. For me, it's not always been that way. It seems I have to work for everything <laughs> and make it happen. So you got to be determined and have grit. That's for sure when it, it's not always easy. Um, so here I have everything we've talked about so far. And I just want to point out that what makes real estate so interesting is it's a mix and match of all of these things. And there's so much dynamicism that goes on in real estate. And um, one of the people that's done super well in our REAPS group, he thinks of it as a chess game. You know, he's always maneuvering, what should I do next? How should I play this? How should I finance it? You know, that kind of thing. And I think of it too as leapfrog because you can have exponential gains and, you know, you buy an apartment building and it appreciates that's really, really exponential. So, there's a lot that can happen when you do things the right way. The possibilities are endless and, you know, always exciting. So I want to talk about ways to get better returns. And, you know, some people don't want to be involved. They just want to have their life and have a little bit on the side and be more passive investors. And other people are in the game and the game is their life. You know, being an active investor is their life. It's all consuming. So you can be somewhere in between there, right? And your sophistication level makes a big difference. But, you know, obviously you've got to buy and hold rental and that's what most people think about. But if you buy and hold that property and rehab it and buy it subject to, and some of that mortgage is already paid down, you get the benefit that the sellers are even paying that mortgage for seven years and you take it over at that point, that's going to be a lot better return than just the standard buy and hold. If you do an aggressive mortgage pay down on top of that, and then when you do go sell, you use a 1031 exchange and you get into a larger property. Or if you buy a property that has a lot of rooms and you've got four or five or six bedrooms, sometimes even up to 10, rarely, but they're out there. You can rent by the room or do student housing or Airbnb. Um, and then buying and selling when the market is in your favor to do that. So buying 
at the beginning of the upward trend of the cycle, it's a huge difference in how much wealth you have in the long run. And then thinking about some properties are really good for cash flow and some are really good for appreciation. So you might want to have a mix of different kinds of properties in your portfolio so that it makes qualifying easier as well, too, because those cash flow properties will help you qualify more than the appreciating of that uh, property as well. All right. And then there's more to think about. What kind of hats do you want to wear in this whole game? You know, do you want to do everything and be completely hands on or do you want to be just writing checks and telling people what to do? I've seen everything in between. So it depends on your personality and your skills, your time available, your money available. Um, so, yeah, there's all kinds of different roles within this game. You've got to find the property, negotiate it, fund it. You've got the down payment portion, the financing part. You've got the design and the project management if you're rehabbing uh, or building new. You've got construction remodel uh, permits, repairs. Then you've got marketing if you're going to sell or are you going to rent it? Even the, if you rent it, there's a little bit of marketing and staging. So there's all kinds of things in there for everybody to get involved in. So. You know, there's a lot of people that spend a lot of time studying and I appreciate that because there is a lot to know about real estate. So I tell people, even if you just start coming and getting educated for a couple of years, that's OK. You're going to still be learning. I'm still learning every single day. And as you saw, my tongue got tied on a lot of things because I don't have them down perfectly. Um, there's a lot to know. So, um, you know, this is a quote from Walt Disney. The way to get started is quit talking and begin doing. So uh, we have a. Uh, goals and accountability and Wendy on here is one of our leaders so that's part of that you know you got to get your goals going and get it into action all right so you know have your vision what you want to end up with in the end where you want to end up with in the end who you want to be with at the end and uh, start working towards that absolutely that's what I have to say <laughs> You've said a lot, Angelique. Thank you so much. <laughs> Woo, that's a lot of information, you know? Mm -hmm. I think the theme is, guys, um, break it down. Focus on what you want to focus on. Um, come to REAPS. It's a great place, but there's other places to get education. So I'll get educated. Again, Angelique said in the last um, video there, you, sooner or later, you got to start doing, you know? Or there, you can kick the tire so long, and you can get educated so much, but sooner or later, you have to reach out and buy a property and, and make something happen. Angelique Tinney, the president of REAPS, thanks for all your, what you do with REAPS, Angelique. Thanks for this okay. presentation. Thanks for your knowledge. Angelique, comes to, do you go to all the satellite groups? I try to, unless I'm on vacation, but I do make an effort to go to all of them. I enjoy it. Yeah, she's, she's at the one sure in Everett. So second well. Saturday of the month, uh, nine o'clock-ish is when we start. Presentation starts around 10 o'clock on the Saturday morning. Angelique is there. I'm there um, sometimes. Tom is there sometimes. We have our co-hosts that are there, and we have speakers that are there, and it's a, just a great place. So that's North End. And as I mentioned, there are satellite groups all around the Pacific or the Puget Sound. So hopefully you can plug into those and come to the main one, the main event down. Thurs what, which Thursday of the month is it, An Angelique? It's the fourth Thursday. Fourth Thursday. Um, six o'clock is when things start. There's some business booth and you get to um, interact with people. And then the presentation starts at seven typically. Is that correct? That's right. So networking for the first hour. We have some food there and a lot of socializing for the first hour. All right. Thank you again, Angelique, for your time. Appreciate it very much. Oh, thank you. You did a great job on your section too. All right. See you later. Thanks, guys, for coming. Bye-bye.